The story of the kings and queens of England is more surprising than you might think. It's a fine drama, a thousand years of tales of lust and betrayal, of heroism and cruelty, of mysteries, murders, tragedies and triumphs. Oh, you're probably thinking that applies to medieval kings, all right. But this programme's about the modern monarchy, from Victoria to the home life of our own dear Queen. And there's not much of that sort of thing going on here. Oh, really? Keep watching. What, you may wonder, did lust have to do with the matronly Queen Victoria? Well, she was young once, and her husband, Prince Albert, gave his name to more than just a bridge, a concert hall and a memorial. No other British royal has a body piercing named after him. And we can't show you where the ring goes in a Prince Albert, you'll just have to guess. Kept Victoria happy, nine children. And this isn't only a collection of royal trivia for the tabloids. We can reveal for the first time on television that the present Queen's grandfather, George V, actually took over the running of the country. Secret personal rule for a few days in 1931. He believed it was the only way to save the country from revolution. Most of the papers relating to this are still hidden. How much do we really know about what goes on? In 1867, Walter Badger wrote a book on the British Constitution which said that it had two parts, the efficient part and the dignified part. The dignified part was headed by the Queen, it was a piece of theatre whose only purpose was to make people feel loyalty. The actual power was entirely held by the efficient part, which he said was a secret committee called the Cabinet. Everyone believed Bajo's book. The government encouraged people to believe it. So did the royal family, then and now. Well, they would, wouldn't they? The truth has been rather different. Obviously, when the 18-year-old Victoria came to the throne in 1837, she wasn't in much of a position to try to run the country. She'd had a rather odd upbringing. Her father had been a brother of George IV and William IV, but he died when she was a baby. Her mother was a straight-laced German princess who was determined that her daughter should not be part of the disreputable life of the court, or murdered as her mother thought possible, by one of her terrible uncles who wanted the throne himself. She was brought up in isolation in Kensington Palace, which in those days was rather cut off from London. Her main interest on becoming queen was to finally cut free of her mother and supervisor and move out of her mother's bedroom. And when she was 19, she fell hopelessly, utterly in love with her first cousin, the 20-year-old younger son of the Duke of saxe coburg gotha He's excessively handsome, such beautiful eyes. My heart is quite going. He certainly tried hard to look good. That notorious ring piercing, if it did exist, no one can be quite sure, was attached to a chain to assist in smoothing the line of his breeches. They married in 1840. She wasn't hugely popular at the time. Headstrong, willful, she actually blocked a change of government because it would have upset her domestic arrangements. The Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, had given her the wives and daughters of his own supporters as the ladies of her bedchamber. When his Whig government fell and Robert Peel came to power, Peel insisted that the Queen should replace at least some of the ladies so that the court wasn't a complete one-party state. Victoria refused. Peel felt forced to resign and Melbourne came briefly back to power. People didn't like what she was doing. They didn't like her, and they didn't like the stiff German, Prince Albert. Peel came back to power and refused to grant him much more than half the allowance Victoria demanded, saying that people were very hard up, which they were. The position of the throne seemed pretty shaky. It didn't seem likely that this would become the most secure and richest monarchy in the world. How did that happen? When Victoria came to the throne, all she had as her own was the revenue of the Duchy of Lancaster, £27,000 a year. The Sunday Times Rich List for 1990 showed Elizabeth II as being worth 
billion pounds. That's nearly 10 billion in today's money. The richest person in the land by a huge margin. It's true that the latest rich list shows her being worth a mere 250 million. Has she lost 97% of her money on the horses? Did she give it all away to charity? No. The latest figure is a guess, based on an instruction to the Sunday Times not to count anything she holds on trust for the nation. Obviously, she can't sell the crown jewels and pocket the proceeds, but actually, most rich people hold much of their wealth in trust, yet it's still treated as theirs, because they have the use of it. The royal move into profit began when Albert took charge of the royal finances. He wasn't allowed to be king. There was deep suspicion of him. But Victoria let him manage her affairs, and he did an astonishing job of it. The royal household was an incredible Gothic antique. To clean a window in Buckingham Palace was a job for the Lord Chamberlain's staff. Unless it was a kitchen or scullery window, then they had to call on the Lord Steward. And neither could touch the outside of the glass, which was looked after by the Office of Woods and Forests. Laying a fire was the Lord Steward's job, but lighting it, the Lord Chamberlain's. As their staff were not on good terms, the Queen froze. Other palace staff were paid for jobs whose very purpose and even existence had been forgotten. Enter Albert with boiling water and a hatchet. He sorted that lot out and cut Victoria's costs dramatically. He had a huge capacity for work and organization, so when he came up with the idea for a great exhibition of the world's arts and industry, no one should have doubted that he could make it happen. Of course, they did doubt it. They had no confidence in the exhibition hall, the Crystal Palace, a giant greenhouse erected by a gardener. And when they realized that thousands would congregate there, they thought that it would be a rallying point for revolutionaries. The opening of the Great Exhibition on May the 1st, 1851, was a thrilling day for the nation and for Victoria. The royal couple began to be viewed with some enthusiasm, and it was quite understandable that the next year an eccentric miser should leave the Queen half a million pounds in his will. Albert's influence in government rose visibly, which of course soon put an end to his popularity. By 1854, it was generally believed that Albert the Foreigner was a traitor in league with Russia, forcing loyal ministers out of office. Crowds gathered round the tower under the impression that Albert and Victoria had been arrested for treason. That frenzy died down, but at the back of it were two things that were going to be permanent problems. One was that the Queen and her consort must have some role in running the country, but that couldn't be squared with any kind of representative government. And the other was that people were realizing that the monarch was making a profit, and they didn't like it. The solution was to conceal what was really happening under a cloak of secrecy, and that cloak is still in place. When I was researching a book on the most sensitive part of this story, I needed to see some papers that should have been released by the Ministry of Defence. The then Navy Minister, David Owen, read the file and released it, but the crucial documents weren't there. He suggested they would have been treated as the private property of the Crown and kept in the Royal Archive, private. I wasn't allowed in. Albert's own role was pretty secret. He was in reality acting as King of England, but that was behind the scenes. The title he was eventually given in 1857 was just Prince Consort. He took it very seriously and worked himself to death. His last act as the hidden King of England was at the end of 1861 to stop the Prime Minister from sending an angry dispatch to the American government. If it had been sent, England would probably have been pushed into the American Civil War, on the side of the South. When Albert died, Victoria uttered a terrible shriek. She never recovered. She retired to Scotland and went into what seemed to be everlasting mourning. She and Albert had built a number of retreats for themselves, Osborne on the Isle of Wight, Sandringham in Norfolk, and her favourite Balmoral. Here she hid for months at a time with the faithful Highland retainer, John Brown. He was allowed enough familiarity for the Queen to be widely referred to as Mrs Brown. <laughs> 
Victoria herself could see no reason to take part in public ceremonies like the opening of Parliament. She thought that her hidden role as the head of her government was enough. But that, of course, led many people to wonder why they had to pay for her upkeep at all. She received, as she had done from the start of her reign, £385,000 a year from the government. It was more than she needed. Her court was nowhere near as expensive as, for instance, George IV's had been. And without her being visible, many people could see no point in her having this money. By the 1870s, there was a strong Republican movement expressing itself in newspapers, large public meetings, and in Parliament. The nature of the country was changing dramatically. New industrial cities were darkening the landscape with smoke and soot. A new kind of society was forming, a society of factory workers and low-paid artisans, of builders and miners and metal workers. These were people outside the political world with no natural attachments to traditional political structures. And there were a lot of them. The anti-royalist head of steam built up every time Parliament was asked for extra grants to Victoria's children when they came of age or married. But in fact, it was very probably these children who saved her throne. No British statesman wanted to see the royal family given its marching orders when their marriages offered such a useful back door into the chancelleries of Europe. Victoria's eldest daughter was married to the heir to the Kaiser of the new German Empire and was a strong and useful influence on her husband and a thorn in Bismarck's flesh. The heir to the British throne, Albert Edward, had married Alexandra, daughter of the King of Denmark and sister of the King of Greece. The Greek crown had actually been offered to another of Victoria's sons, Alfred. The Greeks had sacked their own king and held a national vote on who should get the throne. 95% of them voted for Alfred, who was at the time an 18-year-old midshipman in the Royal Navy. The government made him turn it down because they had promised to keep their hands off Greece. Never mind. It went as a sort of hand-me-down to the son of England's good friend, the King of Denmark. And in 1874, Alfred married the daughter of Tsar Alexander II, which was jolly useful given the Anglo-Russian competition on the edges of India. These were marriages that would produce many, many well-distributed children. By the time Victoria died in 1901, she had over 90 living descendants. It was a full-time job just getting them birthday presents. The rulers of Germany, Greece, Romania, Norway, Russia, Yugoslavia, Spain and Sweden would all trace their descent from this stout little lady. There was a downside to all this royal intermarriage. Victoria was a carrier of haemophilia, the condition that prevents blood from clotting, and the Spanish, Prussian and Russian royal families were consequently affected by it. But even if the British government had known about that, they wouldn't have shed many tears over it. As a system for exercising influence abroad, the monarchy was well worth the money. It also ought to have the advantage at home of inducing people to be loyal to their country, even if they detested its government, which was obviously very useful if you ran that government. But to sell monarchy to the British public, that monarchy needed rebranding. Enter, in 1867, a new Tory Prime Minister, Mr Disraeli. Just the man to do it. He flattered, flirted and lured Victoria out of mourning and back to public life, creating her Empress of India, turning her into the Queen Empress. Britain was now a world power with an international trade that dwarfed all others. Its navy dominated the oceans and its empire expanded on the simple principle that trade follows the flag. And if the Union Jack is flying in each remote corner of the globe, then other flags aren't. The problem was for a small country with a very small army to rule ever more of the Earth's surface. That rule couldn't be maintained by force. It required the consent of the governed. And the grand theatricality of Disraeli's Victorian imperialism invited people throughout the empire to take pride in being subjects not of a bunch of industrialists and politicians, but of a prim and matronly great sovereign. Victoria became the logo of the British Empire, 
her portrait spread all over the world, thanks especially to the introduction of postage stamps. Her statue would appear in virtually every ambitious town and city of the British Empire. And where there was no statue, there would certainly be a Victoria Street, or Victoria Park, or Victoria something. The whole process came to a glorious climax in her Golden Jubilee of 1887. The great processions in London of representatives of her dominions were followed by an eruption of ugly public halls, clock towers, fountains and statues disfiguring public spaces over about a quarter of the planet. By the time Victoria died, hardly anyone even remembered that her throne had once seemed endangered. And she'd reigned so long, 64 years that hardly anyone could even remember any other sovereign. Her death in 1901, 22 days into the new century, seemed portentous. She'd become synonymous with Britain and its empire, and now Britons would leave the 19th century without the security of the great mother hen. Victoria would cast a long shadow. Elizabeth II, coming to the throne 51 years later, would be the first of her successors who had no personal memory of her. Her oldest son, Albert Edward, the new King Edward VII, was already 59 years old. The funeral of the Queen Empress and Edward's coronation involved a huge invention of traditions and ceremonies. And in this atmosphere, it's not surprising that Edward was granted an annual allowance even greater than Victoria's. A few voices said that it was unnecessary for the king to have as big an income as Andrew Carnegie, the Bill Gates of his day, but no one took much notice. Edward had been given a miserable and oppressive childhood. Victoria had measured him by the impossible yardstick of her hero worship of the perfect man, his father. Naturally, young Bertie had rebelled. Of course, his first visit to a prostitute shocked his parents deeply. It happened to be followed by Albert's fatal illness, which Victoria had inevitably blamed on her wicked son. She had arranged his marriage shortly afterwards in the hope that domestic discipline would rein him in. Princess Alex of Denmark was beautiful, but she was also deaf and dull company. With nothing much else to do, Bertie had become the living epitome of the life of the Belle Epoque, a life of champagne drinking, cigar smoking, horse racing, gambling and entertaining showgirls and pretty married ladies. He was naturally drawn to the company of outsiders, not just shady characters, but Jews and Catholics, bankers and foreigners, and he was outspokenly outraged by the casual racism of the empire. Because a man has a black face and a different religion than our own, there is no reason why he should be treated as a brute. He sat on a commission on working-class housing and even invited a member of the working class to stay at Sandringham. Admittedly, the man in question was an MP and a fellow member of the commission, and he had to eat in his bedroom because he didn't have the right clothes to come down to dinner. But still... By the time Edward came to the throne... He was a big, fat old man with a social conscience and a comforting mistress, Alice Keppel, who understood him perfectly. Edward saw himself as something like a nursery rhyme monarch, magnificent and jolly, caring and helpful. In 1903, completely ignoring his government, he went to France and started negotiations for a treaty that would become the Entente Cordiale, isolating Germany. He detested his nephew, the Kaiser. He persuaded the press and then the government to back a treaty which guaranteed that if Germany attacked France, Britain would go to war. So that's what happened in 1914. He determinedly resisted any increase in democracy in Britain and was a firm opponent of votes for women. The crunch over his reactionary views came when Lloyd George planned to introduce old age pensions in 1909. To raise the cash, there would have to be new taxes on income. The Tory majority in the House of Lords voted down what was called the People's Budget, and when the Liberal government drew up legislation to take that power away from the Lords, they voted that down too. 
obviously. So the Prime Minister told the King he needed to create about 250 new peers to swing the vote. Edward was not enthusiastic. Would he actually defy the government? In May 1910, in the middle of the battle, he died. In 1910, Edward's 44-year-old son George inherited the throne. He was the late king's second son. He'd worked as a commander in the navy to which he was deeply attached. But in 1892, his elder brother Clarence had died and he'd unexpectedly become heir. To step into his brother's shoes, he'd left his job and married the woman who'd been betrothed to Clarence, a relative called Princess Mary of Teck. He now inherited a fortune worth around 140 million in today's prices and a political crisis. As part of the deal with the government to pass the budget and cut the powers of the House of Lords, it was agreed that the Crown could stop paying any income tax. In return, the King would pay for his own trips abroad. The new constitutional deal drew the teeth of the House of Lords. Whatever the elected government in the Commons decided to do, it now could do. The only possible break on its power was now the King, and the question was, of course, whether he would ever exercise it, and what would happen if he tried. At first, the crown was too weak to try. When war began with Germany in 1914, George was seen, naturally enough, as a German, which he was. He kept a bit quiet about his courtesy titles of Field Marshal General of the Prussian Army and Admiral of the Imperial German Navy. To make himself seem more British and therefore more secure, in July 1917, George felt forced to change his family name from saxe coburg gotha to Windsor and stop being a German prince and Duke of Saxony. Revolution was a real danger. Cousin Nicky, the Tsar of Russia, was deposed in February 1917. The new Russian government asked Britain to give him asylum and Lloyd George agreed to it. But King George was terrified of being associated with a man now labelled tyrant by revolutionaries, so he forced the government to withdraw the offer. The Bolsheviks took over Russia in October and Nicholas and his family were slaughtered. To protect the king's reputation, it was put about that Lloyd George had refused to rescue them, despite the king's pleading. Then in November 1918, a German revolution forced the Kaiser, Cousin Willy, to abdicate, and Germany gave up the war. The whole political landscape had been transformed. There had been six emperors when George was crowned. By 1925, he was the only one left, and his world was not exactly safe. Most of the Southern Irish were committed Republicans. Attempts to hold that country by force were disastrous, and in 1922 the Irish Free State had come into being. King George had lost a considerable chunk of his kingdom. The wealth of the royal family continued to grow, due largely to Queen Mary's enthusiasm for collecting valuable trinkets at special prices. The Romanovs hadn't been allowed to join the British royals, but a substantial chunk of their jewellery did. People began hiding their treasures if the Queen was coming to call, as she would hint strongly that she expected to be given them, and sometimes take them anyway, so that embarrassed aides had to quietly return them later. In 1924, Ramsay MacDonald became Britain's first Labour Prime Minister. The old political establishment had been given a kicking, no one knew where this might lead. And then came the Wall Street crash of 1929 and financial disaster. The government needed huge loans, which were conditional on cuts in unemployment benefit and the pay of public servants and the armed forces. The Labour cabinet wouldn't do it, and MacDonald went to the king to resign. George was pretty sure this was a decisive moment. If these harsh policies were forced through by conservatives, class war would probably break out. Everything, including himself, might very well be swept away. 
so he refused to accept the resignation. He persuaded Ramsay MacDonald that it was his patriotic duty to stay on as the leader of a new coalition government to force through the cuts. That way, they were more likely to be accepted. This was an extraordinary exercise of royal power, and it wasn't over yet. When the cuts were announced in September 1931, the entire Atlantic fleet went on strike. This was the most powerful military force in the world, and it was gathered at Invergordon. There was total panic in the Admiralty. Mutiny! The intelligence services warned that it was a communist plot and that the sailors were going to march to London, rallying all the disaffected, including the police, on the way. The financial markets went into a tailspin and the Bank of England was forced to stop exchanging pounds for gold, going off the gold standard. The Admiralty drew up plans to bombard the mutinous fleet from the land and sink its own ships. And the King decided he had to save the Navy and the country. He knew sailors. They weren't revolutionaries. They just needed to be spoken to in the right way. In complete secrecy, he took control, appointing a retired Admiral to deal with the situation. Admiral John Kelly was not appointed by the government or the Admiralty and was instructed not to report to them, but directly to King George. He offered the sailors a deal. If they sailed back to their home ports, the King would see to it that their grievances were taken seriously and they would not be punished. It was a sensible approach and it worked. But all evidence of the King's role and Kelly's appointment was hidden. We're not supposed to know what power royalty can wield. Of course, the bit about mutineers not being punished was a lie. Once the danger was passed, the leaders were identified and quietly removed. The following year, 1932, King George gave the first Christmas radio message. He was now a presence in homes throughout his empire. The empire had changed its form, of course, and in 1931, the dominions, the white bits of the empire, Canada, Australia, and so on, had become legally independent of Westminster. They were the Commonwealth, and the sovereign was its institutional core. As part of his programme to make the monarchy seem British, and so he hoped more secure, he decreed that his children need not marry partners of royal descent. This would indeed transform the position of the monarchy, not in the way he expected. In 1936, when George was 70 and dying, his doctor, Lord Dawson, decided to ensure that the death would not be reported first in the vulgar evening papers. You've heard of Lord Dawson of Penn. He's killed any number of men. And that's why we sing, Oh God, save the King, from Bertrand, Lord Dawson of Penn. Lord Dawson met the Times' deadline by giving the king a fatal injection, called a whiz-bang. George was told he would soon be convalescing in Bognor. His last words were, Bugger, Bognor. The Times was told he'd said, How is the Empire? His successor, his son Edward, was 38, the poorly educated child of rather dysfunctional parents. The Queen had been completely distant, and King George famously said, My father was frightened of his father, I was frightened of my father, and I'm damn well going to see to it that my children are frightened of me. Edward had escaped by travelling widely, and as the world's most eligible bachelor enjoyed affairs with a number of married women culminating in the love of his life, the twice-married, elegant American Wallace Simpson. At the time of Edward's succession, the affair was in full swing, and her husband had resigned himself to a divorce. The British press completely censored the whole subject, while the rest of the world was fascinated by it. Edward insisted that he was going to marry Wallace and make her queen. The Prime Minister and the Archbishop of Canterbury said the country wouldn't stand for it. Were they right? Probably not. Edward was actually pretty popular. He wanted to go on the radio and appeal to the nation. But he wasn't allowed to do that. He was told it would be unconstitutional. Without a written document, the Constitution is what the government can get away with. They had their reasons. 
These went beyond the court gossip that Wallace was said to be a lesbian or a man engaged in a sadomasochistic relationship with Edward. The crucial issue wasn't even that the head of the church shouldn't marry a divorcee or that secret investigators had reported that Wallace Simpson had two other lovers, a car salesman and an Irish peer. The real reason only came to light in 2002. Secret documents show that the FBI told the British government that Wallace had another lover, the German ambassador von Ribbentrop. In fact, the FBI said she was a Nazi agent. That was why the government insisted Edward must give her up to keep the throne. Edward chose love rather than the crown. He abdicated and took Mrs. Simpson to live in France. The coronation went ahead, but with his brother Albert sitting on the throne. Albert was crowned as King George VI. He was 18 months younger than Edward and completely lacked his brother's social grace. He stammered, he was shy, but at least he was safely married to Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, the daughter of a minor Scottish aristocrat, the first royal to legally marry a commoner since Henry VIII. George didn't have much in the way of winning ways, but his wife, enraged at what Edward had done, was determined to help him through. She arranged speech therapy to cure his stutter. But when war with Germany began in 1939, they were not seen as a rallying point for patriotic fervour, especially as they had publicly supported Neville Chamberlain's appeasement of Hitler. When the royal couple visited the first bomb sites, they were booed. George VI and Queen Elizabeth, that's the woman we remember as Elizabeth the Queen Mother, refused to allow themselves any doubt as to the outcome of the Second World War. When Buckingham Palace was bombed, the Queen said she was glad. It meant she could look the East End in the face. At least it meant the royal couple wouldn't be booed anymore when they visited other people's bombed-out homes. Actually, while they spent their days in London, they retreated for the night to Windsor, which was considerably safer. Nevertheless, they did have one really narrow escape. As the war went on, the royal couple became more and more identified with Churchill as the spirit of Britain, dogged in their determination to see Nazism defeated. When the victory celebrations came in 1945, it seemed natural that they should revolve around Buckingham Palace. By the time of his premature death from smoking in 1952, this shy country gentleman and his queen had gone a very long way to restoring the monarchy to its central place in British life. It had vanished virtually everywhere else. There had been 16 monarchies on the continent of Europe when Victoria died. Now there was only Sweden. Monarchs were restored to Belgium, Holland, Norway and Denmark, but as a pale shadow of the old European royalty. The new queen, the 25-year-old Elizabeth II, seemed to be a fairy tale remnant of a lost world of glamour. Her coronation was a celebration of pageantry itself in a country that was a vast bomb site. Four houses out of ten had been damaged or destroyed. It was even shown on the new medium of television, though the Archbishop of Canterbury feared men would watch in pubs without removing their hats. By her side in the coronation coach rode her husband. Like Albert, he would never be crowned. Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, was from the Greek and Danish royal house of schleswig holstein sondenburg Glücksburg. He had no surname. He was given the name of one of the branches of Elizabeth's family, Mountbatten. There was no question of the Queen becoming a modest suburban sovereign like the restored European royals. 
George's widow was sure her daughter should be regal and grand. Royalty required flunkies and castles and palaces and golden coaches. She herself made do with six cars, three chauffeurs, five chefs, two pages, three footmen, two dressers, and thirty secretaries, maids, treasurers, and housekeepers. And she was absolutely dead set against royalty paying tax. For a long time, this was met with an extraordinary degree of complicity from the governments of the day. In 1947, when Labour came to power, amid all the nationalizations and the class war declarations of we are the masters now, had come an agreement that the government would take over the cost of running Buckingham Palace. Now the Conservatives said the government would take over the cost of the royal train and royal visits abroad and freed the Queen from paying tax on property, apart from rates on Sandringham and Balmoral. In Edward Heath's time as Prime Minister, it was officially stated for the first time that the Queen pays no tax. In 1973, she was exempted from the new Companies Bill that could force shareholders to identify themselves even if they hid behind the names of nominees. Her shares are hidden in a company called the Bank of England Nominees, which can only be used by heads of state and is uniquely exempt from disclosure laws. And in 1965, when a Labour government introduced capital gains tax, they declared that the Queen is exempt. Under these arrangements, immense and unknowable riches were built up. She has, for example, six hundred works by Leonardo da Vinci. We're told these riches are not really hers because she's not free to sell them. But most of the royal collection is never publicly displayed. Why? Whose interest is being served? It obviously means the monarchy can put on a heck of a show that goes far beyond their demand on the public purse and they don't need to run the risk of asking us to fund the whole thing from taxes. We each contribute 61 pence a year at the last count. That money, just over 36 million pounds, is not enough to put on the grand regal show which the British monarchy seems to be about. Certainly for a very long time it was simply not permitted to suggest that the monarchy should be anything less than grand. In 1957, Lord Altrincham wrote an article arguing for a modernised monarchy. He called the court complacent and out of touch, said the Queen was a priggish schoolgirl and said that the monarchy should not be, as it was, intimately associated with the upper classes. Wow! The Duke of Argyll said that he should be hanged, drawn and quartered and the BBC immediately dropped him from any questions. In fact, Altrincham had got it wrong. Lavish splendour was just what most of the public wanted from their monarchy. They would have despised a queen on a bicycle. They wanted to be deferential. They probably still do. And there were 20 more years of this kind of thing to come. In 1977, the year of the Queen's Jubilee, the Sex Pistols anthem God Save the Queen and Her Fascist Regime was banned from being broadcast, even when it outsold all other records. The puzzle becomes even more intriguing when you look at the apparently shrinking role of the crown in public affairs. The imperial title had already disappeared in the days of George VI, when India and Pakistan became independent. The empire became the Commonwealth, and of the 58 past and present members of that vague organisation, only 16 have Elizabeth as their head of state, and falling. Why did it matter so much to protect and sustain royalty? Partly, perhaps, it's more to do with the Queen herself than the institution of monarchy. Elizabeth I, Victoria, Elizabeth II. The rule of elderly matriarchs seems to be particularly proper to the English. And it may provide important social glue. As the population of Britain became more heterogeneous, with substantial immigration from Commonwealth countries by people who feel excluded from political life and often from the legitimate economy, perhaps there was a hope that the Queen would be a focus of patriotic attachment. After all, she's the linchpin of the Commonwealth, its graciously enthusiastic figurehead. In 
and promoting the image of a glamorous and golden royalty above and outside politics that is synonymous with Britain may be a very useful way of creating legitimacy for a state that might otherwise look rather shabby. The last great moment of this Mrs. Camilla Parker Bowles, Alice Keppel's great-granddaughter. Diana said that on the honeymoon he was more interested in reading eight books by Lawrence van der Post than in her, and he wore Charles Camilla cufflinks, and when she became distressed, she felt strongly that the royal family turned against her. In 1992, it all blew apart in what the Queen called her Annus Horribilis. Her second son, Andrew, separated from his wife, Sarah Ferguson, who was pictured topless being kissed by her financial adviser. Her daughter, Princess Anne, divorced Captain Mark Phillips. Charles and Diana split up, with spectacular accusations being made in the press and on television. And Windsor Castle caught fire. That was when the ground really began to shift. At least when it was explained that the £40 million repair bill would be paid by the public, there was a huge collective breath of, no it won't. And so the Queen decided it would be much the wisest thing to offer to pay 70% of the cost. She opened up some of her homes to the public to raise the cash. There was still astonishingly little direct criticism of the Queen. In an age when television and the press have the power to pull down anyone, the Queen and her mother were treated with respect, even devotion. But the rest of the royal family had become fair game and were subjected to a ferocious assault of public humiliation. Why did we support the royal family and all their wealth? Why were we giving them all this money? The press pack was baying at their heels. That's when the Queen agreed that she should voluntarily start paying income tax and refund the parliamentary allowances received by other members of the royal family. But things didn't get any better. And the Queen herself began to be criticised in 1997 when Princess Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris. We all remember the shock and horror and the debate about the lack of public reaction by the senior members of the royal family. There was a widespread feeling that at that moment they were not in fact part of the nation. Was the programme started by George V of integrating the monarchy into the life of the nation, coming unraveled. Instead of the monarch playing the role of warning and advising the Prime Minister, which is supposed to be her constitutional role, the Prime Minister warned and advised the Sovereign to take public action. She had to be seen to grieve, or the monarchy itself might be in danger. And now we wait to see what happens next. The heir to the throne and his mistress are forever tainted with the image of the princess that was publicly destroyed. The queen is an old lady with a reign that begins to rival Victoria's in length. Can anyone be certain that the country would accept her son as king? There's always been a bargain at the heart of monarchy in this country. The monarch has always been dependent on the people. That bargain has been the key to survival. It began when William the Conqueror realised that he and his friends couldn't actually run a country where they didn't speak the language or know the laws, traditions or even the geography. It was restated in a series of crises in which monarchs who tried to rule without consent were simply dumped. Matilda, Jane Grey, Richard Cromwell, James II. And to give that consent, people need to feel that the sovereign is entitled to be there and respects laws even though no court can enforce them. Laws which today probably include having to pay tax. Partly, of course, the institution is sustained by the character of the Queen herself. Faced with enormous pressures and a job from which there is no possibility of rest, she has retained a calm resilience and exquisite constitutional carefulness which guarantees her a respectful place in history. Then what? The British monarchy is certainly a great addition to the gaiety of nations. Partly as a soap opera, partly as a walking, talking anachronism that makes other heads of state visibly uneasy. But it does come at a price. <laughs>
and whether the price is too high for the continued survival of this most extraordinary form of government, well, that, of course, will be the surprise ending. Spend this Sunday evening exploring ancient Egypt, beginning with Michael Wood's top ten sites. That's tonight from six. Coming up, the story of the strongest, sharpest blade that's ever been made, a decisive weapon.